You know, in our introduction to the book of Revelation, uh, I don't know whether we'll finish up the handout that I gave you yesterday in this session or whether it'll take two more, but uh, some years some years we've spent two and sometimes three sessions on the int introduction. It just remains to be seen how quickly we can take this material. We're actually at the fourth page of the handout, <clears throat> and... We want to now look at the various interpretive approaches to the book of Revelation. Now, as you are well aware, I'm sure, I mean, it would be very unusual if you didn't know this, most people understand Revelation to be about the future, that it describes things that have yet to come to pass. This is uh, the assumption that most people have because it's the only approach to the book of Revelation they've ever heard of. Now, there is a possibility that you've heard of other approaches, but most people have just heard of the futurist approach. And that is uh, one of several approaches we want to consider. There are actually five main approaches, or uh, I, I call them approaches. We could call them schemes of interpretation or whatever of the book of Revelation. And they're all very different from each other. The futurist approach, which is the most well-known, is, is really not necessarily the one that has the longest history of being believed and taught in the Christian church. And it is also, to my mind, not the most credible in view of the evidence from the book of Revelation itself. <clears throat> and yet, since it's the only view that most people have heard, uh, many have overlooked the problems of it simply because they didn't, uh, they didn't know any other options. I know that when I was first taught the book of Revelation, I was taught, as most people were, from the futurist viewpoint. I assumed it to be correct, and I even taught it myself for some time, and then uh, the more I studied the book of Revelation, the more I found parts uh, of the book of Revelation that didn't seem to fit that picture. And I found that difficult, but I, I still didn't abandon the futurist scheme because it was the only, the only approach I knew of to the book of Revelation. I was very pleased to find later in my additional research that throughout history the Christian church has held a number of different views on the book of Revelation. And the majority of the time in Christian history... The futurist approach was not dominant, in fact, was not even held. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not true, but we want to look at the pros and the cons of each of these views. And as it turns out, of course, my own preference will lean toward one or another, but I'm not sure that I want to endorse one view completely over another, simply because I haven't found uh, any of the views to answer all of the questions I have about the book of Revelation. I do lean very strongly toward one of these views, but uh, there are some places in the book of Revelation that I don't see eye to eye with others who hold this particular approach. But let's, uh, let's start out at, w at what seems a, a logical place to start with the historist view, as it is called. The historist view of the book of Revelation considers that the book of Revelation is a running account of church history beginning with the early portion, beginning with the uh, you know, first century church, and going chronologically through the whole of the 2,000 years of church history and ending up talking about the second coming of Christ in the final chapters and the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, this view is perhaps one that you're not familiar with. Maybe you are aware of it. There are some denominations that still uh, have espoused it. Uh, A.B. Simpson, for example, one of the founder, well, the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination, held to the historist view. Uh, perhaps more importantly, all the reformers did. All, all the Reformation leaders, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, held to the historist view of the book of Revelation. According to this view, uh, we have a very symbolic description of events that basically, if you could interpret the symbols, you would be able to understand the whole of church history, not only the part that's past, but also the part that's yet future. And uh, according to this view, for instance, many historists believe that the breaking up of the seven seals on the seven-sealed scroll represents the breaking up of the Roman Empire in the 5th and 6th centuries. Uh, they would interpret the locust invasion of chapter 9 as the Mohammedan invasion, which led to the uh, Crusades. The Beast in chapter 13 is thought to refer to the Roman Catholic Church, or to the papacy, I should say. Uh, 
That's what the reformers thought it meant anyway. And as you go on through, you find that church history is unfolding from the earliest days until the present and then on beyond until the coming of Christ. So that the book of Revelation is said to span the entire period. Uh, there are advantages and seeming disadvantages to holding this view. And I'll seek to show that to be the case with each of the views. In each case, there are some advantages and some disadvantages. And it'll be up to you to decide which view is correct. I'm not here necessarily to push one view, although I'll have my own preferences. <coughs> the advantages of this view are basically the company it keeps. Um, that so many scholars and Christian leaders were unanimously in agreement about this interpretation gives it some credibility, gives it some uh, grounds for being accepted. By the way, this view would take, for instance, the 1260 days, uh, which is uh, taken literally as three and a half years, they take that symbolically of not uh, days, but years. They take the year for a day approach. And so they would say that the 1260 days, uh, which was the time that the beast uh, remains in power, would be essentially the length of time that the papacy uh, governed the church up until the Reformation. Uh, that's just the way the historists would, would approach it. And you can see how the reformers would uh, see in the book of Revelation a justification for their movement, for their, for their breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, the Roman Catholics responded uh, to the reformers by saying that uh, Luther was the beast, and uh, so they could uh, these uh, you know when that took place, uh, there was definitely insults being thrown both directions. But the reformers were not the only people who took the historist approach. Uh, there are some modern people who have, as I've said, uh, uh, A. B. Simpson, the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination, uh, held this view. That does not necessarily mean it's the official view of that denomination. But that was his own personal view. As recently as a few weeks ago, I received in the mail a book from a man somewhere back east. He's the pastor of a church. He's, he's written a book trying to uh, get the historist view uh, a fair hearing again. I must confess, <coughs> of all these views that I'm going to present to you, the historist view is the one that I know the least about. Uh, and the reason for that is that I make it a point to buy books about the book uh, about Revelation and read them. And I have found books from all these other points of view, but I've never found a modern book that is a commentary on the book of Revelation written from the historist view. Now, that doesn't mean they're not out there. I just haven't found them. If they, if they are out there, they're not easily found in Christian bookstores. This book that I recently received in the mail, uh, without requesting it, um, does present the historist view, and, the, and, and it quotes other Christian books that hold that view, but most of the books it quotes are from a previous generation or a previous century. Apparently, this view is held very widely among some of the best commentators on the book of Revelation at a, in a previous generation. It is not as popular a view now as it was then, but it is still held by some, and, and as I said, this recent book that was sent to me is trying to give it a, a revival, trying to turn the church back to the historist view of Revelation. Unfortunately, the book that I received is not itself a commentary on the book of Revelation. It is actually a commentary on the 70 weeks of Daniel, and uh, I haven't really even finished the book, but from time to time the author in talking about Daniel brings up points from the book of Revelation and shows what the historist position was. I would like to find a complete commentary on Revelation written from the historist point of view, and that would make it easier for me to present the case for or against it. Uh, it is a position I'm not able to really represent very uh, strongly because of my relative ignorance of, of its uh, fine points. But the disadvantages of this view, at least what, what I've considered or read from other authors, is that those who have held it have not necessarily agreed on the details. I mean, there are some general thoughts that all histories have held to be true, but the details of interpretation of specific points uh, have been, I guess, disagreed upon, even by those who hold the history's view, which makes it a little difficult. You know, I mean, if it's history that's already been fulfilled, or prophecy that's already been fulfilled, I should say, Excuse me. Then one would hope that at least after its fulfillment, one would understand what it was about. We might be forgiven if we don't understand what a prophecy is about before it's fulfilled. But if after it's fulfilled we still don't know what it was about, then one has to wonder what was the purpose of the prophecy. If you couldn't understand it before it was fulfilled or after it was fulfilled, then essentially it's unintelligible and it seems to serve no purpose. And that, that is one of the drawbacks, of course. If uh, even those who are 
tuned in to this approach to the book of Revelation cannot agree about what some of the prophecies, uh, how they were fulfilled, although they all agree that they were. But they have different opinions about what event in history corresponds to what prediction. That seems to me one of the you know, one of the more dis the greater disadvantages of the approach. That does not prove that the approach is wrong, and uh, I certainly cannot tell you for sure that I would not be convinced if I read a good uh, historist presentation. I simply don't. I haven't read one. I haven't been exposed to one, and uh, so I would just tell you that this is a view that if you hold this view, you're in good company. I guess it depends on how you feel about the reformers. Mm -hmm. Not everything about them is good, but uh, I would say, let's just say you're in company with a lot of Protestants if you hold this view. Yes? But in this view, all, all the events are history? The not quite, not quite. They, I'm not sure exactly what point we now are at according to this view. The, the point would be that we're certainly more than halfway through. I think they placed the Reformation at chapter 11. And the resistance to the Reformation, even uh, you have the, at the end of chapter 11, you have, I think it's at the end of chapter 11. No, it's at the end of chapter 10. 10 and 11, I think, is where they put the Reformation. And uh, I believe it's at the end of chapter 10, or it's in 11, where John hears the seven thunders, and he's told not to write down what the seven thunders said. At least one historist that I heard of said that the seven thunders are the papal bulls that were issued against the reformers but were not worthy to be written down because they were so hollow or so foolish or something like that, you know. Um, and then chapter 13 is where you see the beast, you know, really uh, reigning. So I'm actually, as this is why I would like very much to see a commentary about, you know, written from this point of view, because it, it seems to me like they don't place everything quite in a chronological order. Though I've heard that essentially the view is that you have a chronological unfolding of church history according to this view. So I must confess a higher degree of ignorance than I wish I had about this view. I The other four views I've read m much more about because the books on those views are far more accessible. But I hope uh, I hope to get a chance. Maybe I'll have to order, you know, through some book search, some of these older books from another, from previous generation or previous century that hold this view so I can become more acquainted with it. At any rate, as I said, there are some advantages and some disadvantages of this view as with all the others. If you choose to hold this view, you'll be in the company of people who are usually respected among among evangelicals and Protestants. Um, the second view to consider of the book of Revelation is the futurist view, and that's the one that I mentioned first uh, as we were opening this lecture, the most familiar view to most of us. It is the view that the majority of the book of Revelation is still future. Some of it, notably the seven letters to the seven churches, which are in chapters 2 and 3, are thought to be fulfilled, or at least almost fulfilled, some futurists believe that the seven letters to the seven churches correspond to seven periods of church history. I don't know if you're familiar with that view, but there are many who teach that as you read through the seven letters, Ephesus, Smyrna, and so forth, as you go on through, you're actually reading about seven periods into which the whole 2,000 years of church history divides. And so that when you get to the last letter, Laodicea, that you're looking at a picture of the church in the end of the age, apostate, and so forth. Of course, the dispensationalists uh, are the are the main proponents in our day of the futurist view, although there are non-dispensational futurists. But the dispensationalists have a very negative view of the future of the church, and they believe the church is destined to be a failure, and therefore they see the church of Laodicea, the last of the seven churches, addressed in chapter 3 of Revelation as the church of the last days. Then at chapter 4, verse 1, they see the rapture of the church. At least the dispensationalists do. Uh, because they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And everything after chapter 4 and 5, where John is caught up into heaven and sees a heavenly vision, at chapter 6, where the seven seals begin to be broken on the book, uh, or on the scroll, they believe the great tribulation has begun. And everything from chapters 6 through uh, 19 are thought to be belong to a seven-year tribulation, which is yet future. They see the second coming of Christ in chapter 19, uh, followed by a millennial kingdom on earth in chapter 20, followed by a new heavens and a new earth uh, after the end of this world in chapters 21 and 22. This is how the futurists generally lay out the book of Revelation. Um, most of them see chapter 1, verse 19 as sort of a, an outline of the book. It says, Write the things which you have seen, 
the things which are and the things which will take place after this, or literally in the Greek, after these things, metatautum in the Greek. Now, and they say this is the three divisions of the book of Revelation. The things which you have seen, the vision he saw while he was on Patmos is recorded in chapter 1. The things which are, the second category, is the seven letters to the seven churches, the present church age, found in chapters 2 and 3. Then the things that shall be after these things, sometimes it's said to be after the things of the church, after the church age, in other words, during the tribulation after the church is raptured, and those begin at chapter 4. So that the division is as follows. The things that he, John has seen is in chapter 1. The things which are is in chapters 2 and 3. And the things that shall be hereafter, that is in the future, even from our perspective, are from chapter 4 on. Everything after chapter 4 verse 1 is future for us, according to the futurist view. Uh, there are There is a tendency for the futurist to see the book of Revelation as uh, chronological history in advance. So that as you move through the book, uh, you are reading events in order of their occurrence in a future uh, future tribulation period. There are some futurists that don't take it in a strictly chronological sense. I've known of at least one book, and there probably are others that have taken the view that chapters uh, 6 through 11 are paralleled in chapters 12 through 19. Um, or 4 through 11 are paralleled through 12 through 19. Uh, but, but that these individual sections run mainly chronological within themselves. So also the futurist tends to take a, a literal approach, tends to n neglect symbolism, even despise the suggestion that we are to take things symbolically. Of course, the futurist position is the only position that has the luxury of taking a literal approach. Because it is... If you take a literal approach, you have to say it's all future, because there's never yet been a time recorded in history where locusts with tails like scorpions, faces like men, hair like women, and so forth, tormented the inhabitants of the earth for five months, coming out of a bottomless pit which was opened by an angel. Uh, that has not literally happened. If you, I mean, if you want to take those words in their literal sense, there's never yet been in recorded history a locust plague like that. There has never yet been 200 million horsemen whose horses breathed fire like flamethrowers and whose tails of the horses were like venomous snakes biting people. Uh, there's never been that yet either. There's never yet been a literal seven-headed and ten-horned animal that has ruled the world. If you take these things literally, then of course you must take them future because there's never been any of those things literally happen before. Now, the thing that should be noted, of course, is that even though futurists often insist on a fairly literal approach, they themselves have limits to which they will take it literally. They do not believe, for example, that the beast with seven heads and ten horns is a literal animal. They believe that it refers to, generally they believe it refers to a man, a future antichrist. And in that, they depart from their, ordinary, their ordinarily literal approach. But as much as possible... They do seek to take a literal approach to things. Now, all other views have to take a very symbolic approach to the book of Revelation. Of course, a symbolic approach can be defended very easily when you realize that Jesus is described as a lamb throughout the book of Revelation, which is not a literal description of him. He is not a lamb. He's a human being. When the devil is described as a dragon and a serpent, and the devil is not himself a dragon or a reptile, he's a spirit being, uh, we, I mean, some of the most obvious features of the book of Revelation tell us that it is written in symbols. Yet, the dispensationalist especially, who is a futurist, generally prefers to adhere to a, a literal a form of interpretation. And insofar as he can do that, he can demonstrate that the book of Revelation must be future, because these things have never literally happened. When has it ever happened, for instance, that a third of the oceans turned to blood? Uh, or that a third of the trees of the earth were burned up? or that hailstones 100 pounds ever fell on the earth. Uh, obviously, those things have never literally happened, and insofar as they can insist on a fairly literal approach, they also demonstrate that it must be future. Now, the advantages of this view, uh, I tried to think of as many as I could. Uh, <clears throat> there are three main advantages, seemingly, of this view that would incline people to believe it. One, it's widely held and taught. It is, I think we could say, the most popular view among the rank and file of uh, Western Christians anyway. 
Okay? And uh, the second advantage is that it appeals to our tendency as Westerners to read things literally and interpret them literally. Most of what we read in, in Western uh, you know, literature written in our own culture is written in a literal fashion, and our, our tendency as people of a Western culture is to take things literally. And of course, only a futurist view really accords with this tendency. And so there's a tendency for us to take things literally and therefore to generate toward, or gravitate toward, I should say, a futurist approach. And a third advantage of the futurist approach is that you can harmonize uh, many of the things in the book of Revelation with current events so that it's easy to convince people that the things that are predicted in the book of Revelation are happening before our very eyes. There are, there are whole ministries devoted to this one thing. I just received a, an advertisement in the mail day before yesterday or so, advertising a magazine. I won't, I won't mention the name of the magazine. I had not heard of it before, but the name of it kind of clued me into as to what it was about. And when I opened it, it confirmed my suspicions. It's mainly a magazine devoted to showing how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. And uh, these people, of course, uh, make a living. I guess I don't mean to say that they're in it for the money. I'm sure that many of them are not. But they do. many of them do make their entire living reading the newspapers and, uh, and corresponding things that are happening here and there throughout the world with things that they think are predicted in, in biblical prophecy. And, of course, uh, the book of Revelation has lent itself to this kind of harmonization with current events for a long time. In fact, ever since the futurist view arose, there's been some who've been able to correspond current events with its, uh, with its prophecies. And so these are the things that really make the futurist view attractive, it seems to me. Now, when we get to the disadvantages of the view, it seems to me the futurist view falls victim to its virtues. Uh, the three things that I said are all advantages are also, to my mind, disadvantages of the view. To say it's the most popular view among Christians certainly is not in its favor since the majority has seldom been right about anything. Um, and you certainly don't determine truth by majority vote. And uh, the fact that the majority of modern Christians are not uh, familiar with apocalyptic style writing and are not particularly adept at biblical studies, especially when it requires a great deal of cross-referencing to different parts of the Bible. I'm not saying that only people who hold my views are good at that. I'm simply saying most Christians aren't. Most Christians don't bother to. And the fact that they have take this approach may suggest that it's it's an approach that, that is a fairly surface approach uh, to the book of Revelation. The fact that it is um, that it tends to our, it appeals to our tendency to take things literally, likewise is not necessarily in its uh, to its advantage, uh, since we should not think that the book was written with a mind of being understood that way by Western readers. The, the original readers were Easterners. They were Asian. There were seven churches of Asia to which it was written. And therefore, unless we can demonstrate that people of that culture tended to take things literally also, uh, then taking it literally is not an advantage. We must rather say we should understand it the way that it was intended to be understood by its original readers, insofar as we can ascertain what that way would be. To insist upon a Western... American type of uh, approach to interpretation would be to demonstrate how culture bound we are and how inflexible and unwilling to allow ourselves to understand the Bible as it was intended to be understood by its, especially its original readers. Uh, to say that it can be harmonized with current events, again, the fact that this has been done, especially for the past 150 years and every generation since the, the rise of dispensationalism has found in the book of Revelation a description of its own age suggests that these correspondences are not to be too greatly trusted. I may have mentioned to you before that uh, <coughs> my father, when I was growing up, had a book in his library that was written after World War I. And there was a group of nations, I, I believe it was the League of Nations, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not real familiar with that period of history. Uh, that had, I think there were 13 or so uh, European nations leagued, uh, linked together in a, some kind of a coalition. And uh, the writer of this book, writing after World War I, believed that this grouping of European nations was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. He saw in the horns of the beast a ten-nation confederacy in Europe, just like modern dispensationalists do. Uh, only he was quite convinced that the League of Nations was that confederacy. And I remember him saying so very dogmatically, he says, it's quite obvious that what has arisen out of, after the you know, war 
uh, is this league of nations that clearly fulfills biblical prophecy of the ten horns and the, and the seven heads of the beast and so forth. And he said, uh, now, if the reader would wonder how it is that there are 13 rather than 10 nations, he says, that's the diabolical plot. The devil doesn't want us to recognize this as the 10 nation confederacy spoken of in prophecy, and therefore he's allowed there to be 13, not 10 nations in it, which I guess is, shows you exactly to what lengths prophetic interpreters will go to try to shoehorn events of their own day into their interpretation of biblical prophecy. And by the way, at this present hour, there are a great number of dispensationalists today saying that the uh, European Economic Community is this so-called ten-nation confederacy, which they believe is supposed to arise uh, in Europe. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure of the current thing. The number keeps changing, but uh, as I understand, I think there's 13 nations in uh, the EEC right now, sometimes called the common market. And uh, so I guess they have to either predict that the number 10 is not literal, but I think they're more likely to say it is literal and that we're going to see a change with thir three of these nations getting out. But the point is that different generations have been able to take the same prophecy and see events in their own time as being the fulfillment of that. And whenever I hear guys on the radio saying, you know, prophecy has been fulfilled before our very eyes, and they give examples from current events, I say, this is exactly the way people were talking a generation ago and two generations ago and three generations ago and so forth. And the ability to harmonize almost any world situation with one's interpretation of Revelation seems to make it, uh, it seems to be to its disadvantage. That it, you know, it makes it impossible to be sure that the events that we think in our generation are fulfilling it are the right ones since our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents all thought that the events in their days were. So, these so-called advantages, the very things that make the view popular, to my mind, are disadvantages to the view. There's other disadvantages to the view. Um, if the futurist view is correct, that is, if chapter 4 tells us of the rapture of the church and everything after that happens later, then that means the book is 90% irrelevant to the church. It's especially irrelevant to the generation to whom it was sent. And one would wonder why John would send, or Jesus would send, letters to first century congregations that would have nothing to do with them whatsoever. Nor would it have to do with any Christian, since all Christians would be leaving at chapter 4. And all the events recorded after that would pertain to the world after the church is gone. It seriously causes us to wonder why we would need to know this information, or what value it would have to us. Of what value is information that there's nothing we can do about it, no way that it will affect us because we won't be here. I mean, it's it would just be as if God was trying to satisfy our curiosity. And I guess that's one reason why people like the futurist view, because they do want their curiosity satisfied. But I don't have the impression that God is in the business of just you know satisfying our curiosity about things that are meaningless and irrelevant to our own lives. Um, and to suggest that 90% of the book is irrelevant to the Christian church certainly is... Uh, it certainly gives a character to the book that sounds like it's not a very good approach to the book, since epistles usually are sent to churches about things relevant to their own lives. Um, the same is true of prophecies in the Old Testament. At least if the generation that the prophets spoke to did not experience all the things prophesied, at least their nation did. Uh, they were relevant to a later generation of Jews. And uh, whereas the future view would suggest that the things written in the book, at least the dispensational brand of it, are not relevant to the church of any generation because the church will not even be on the earth at the time that these are fulfilled. <clears throat> it also fails, and this is another disadvantage of the future's view, it tends, it fails to recognize the symbolic character of apocalyptic writing. They would call it spiritualizing if you give a symbolic interpretation to these things, and yet the very book itself has all the marks of a symbolic piece of writing. Almost everything about it is symbolic. There may be some literal things in there, but if they are, they're certainly overwhelmed by a, an abundance of symbols. The book is full of symbols. And uh, I think that the futurist view arose at a time when apocalyptic style was not well appreciated. In fact, it's only been our, in our own times that scholars have become very acquainted with the apocalyptic literature of the, of the period. Uh, in, in the past few decades, it seems to me, I've read that uh, scholars have just really begun to crack the books uh, 
and understand what apocalyptic writing was like. I mean, they've been aware that there are these apocalyptics in existence, but only modern scholars have started to really understand the nature and the character of apocalyptic writing. The more they do so, the more they can appreciate the apocalyptic nature of the book of Revelation. But futurism, in insisting on a fairly literal interpretation, fails to recognize that, that apocalyptic literature is mostly symbolic. Um, <coughs> another serious problem with the futurist view is that in every commentary I've seen on the book of Revelation written from a futurist view, the writer struggles to explain some statements like this in Revelation 1.1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. For the time is near. Now to say that these are things that must shortly take place and that the time is near and to realize that those words were written 2,000 years ago and yet to suggest that the time was not really near at all. And those things were not shortly to take place. In fact, they haven't even yet taken place. That there's at least a 2,000 year gap between the time of the writing, or almost 2,000 year gap, and the time of the fulfillment. Uh, it certainly struggles with these, these words. Now, uh, let me say this. It is not that God could not give a prophecy that is that whose fulfillment is 2,000 years distant. That'd be fine. In fact, some of the Old Testament prophecies were not fulfilled uh, until about 2,000 years after they uttered. This prophecy is about Christ. Some of them go back all the way to Jacob. Jacob prophesied the coming of Christ. So did God in the Garden of Eden. Uh, to, for God to make a prediction and have it come true thousands of years later, that's one thing. God can do that. The problem is he can't very easily do that and tell the listeners this is going to shortly happen. And some people say, well, some commentators just say, well, you know, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. True. But this isn't written to God. It's written to people. It's written to people who are in persecution. It's written to people who are suffering. It's written to comfort people who are in hard times. And basically the message is, listen, it's not long. God's going to vindicate you. It's, the time is short. The prophecy is of ultimate vindication of those who are suffering for Christ's sake. And to say, it's near, it's soon, it's shortly going to happen. And then it doesn't happen for 2,000 years. And then God say, well, I mean, by my way of thinking, it's short. I mean, two days only. Well, that's hardly any, that would hardly be a comfort to a suffering church, you know. What's the point of telling suffering people, this is going to shortly happen. The time is near. And then say, oops, I, I meant by God's way of reckoning time, not yours. Um, <clears throat> to me, that seems rather insensitive and artificial. The way the language states it, one would certainly have the impression that it was a near fulfillment that was promised. And the futurist view does not really do justice to those statements. Um, also, there is a, a obvious lack of chronological sequence in many parts of the book of Revelation which would seemingly give the lie to the interpretation both of historists and of futurist views, because uh, as far as I understand it, they, they for the most part seek a, a chronological fulfillment, that the events follow chronologically in the same order they do in the book of Revelation. But that doesn't seem to be the case in a number of places. For example, we read of what appears to be the end of the world in chapter 11 and verse 18, where it says, the nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Sounds like the resurrection and the judgment at the end of the age. And that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear you, your name, great and small, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. It sounds like an announcement of the end of the world. It happens when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. And... Uh, 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 an announcement that gives that goes along with it in verse 15 is the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. It sounds very much like the end of the world. And yet in chapter 12, for example, we read in the opening verses of the birth of Christ. Or even if some would say that's not the birth of Christ, although most scholars would agree that it is, whatever it is, it can't be something that happens at the end of the world. If you've got the end of the world at chapter 11, it's hard to explain how anything else could follow it except maybe a millennium or a, or a new heavens and new earth, and yet that's not what we read of after chapter 11. 
In fact, if you wanted to be quite literal, you've got the end of the world way back in chapter 6. Because in chapter 6, it says in verse 12 and following, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. And the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and so forth. Uh, that sounds like the end of the world, too. An earthquake that removes every island and every mountain, the stars falling to the earth, the sun is blackened, and so forth. That would be the end of the world if we take those words literally. So if we're taking a literal and a chronological approach, which is the tendency of the futurist, then you've got serious problems here because you have what appears to be the end of the world in chapter 6. You have what also appears to be the end of the world in chapter 11. And neither is at the end of the book or even near the end of the book. So it would seem to turn uh, against the view that we have a chronological and literal sequence of things happening here. Uh, another example where chronological order is, is neglected or doesn't seem to be working is in chapter 10 excuse me, chapter 11, and verse 7, it says, Now when they, the two witnesses, finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. Most would agree this is the same beast that you read of in chapter 13. However, in chapter 13, the beast rises from scratch, from zero. He comes up out of the sea, and that's the beginning of his career. But he's mentioned in chapter 11 before his rise in chapter 13. In chapter 13, the beast is introduced as if for the first time. And yet there's an earlier mention of him persecuting the two witnesses, which simply mean that the, the, the account is not chronological. There must be some parallel sections somehow. <coughs> Another case where chronological order is, uh, is seen to not apply is in chapter 14, In verse 8, it says, Another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Here we read of the announcement that Babylon has fallen. However, later on in chapter 17 and 18, we see Babylon again, alive and well. And the announcement in chapter 18 that Babylon is going to fall, is going to be cast out, cast down like a stone into the sea and so forth. So, Again, we have a, a failure in chronology. Now, it's not a, a flaw in the book of Revelation. It's only a flaw to the, to the interpretation that requires a chronological approach. The book obviously is, it doesn't have, its, have flaws, but interpreted correctly, we should see why it is that we don't have a chronological approach. If one says that we should follow chronologically through the book of Revelation, he's got some hard things to explain. Um, the final disadvantage that I would like to bring up at this point to the futurist view is that its origin is questionable. It is well known, and many commentators have pointed it out, that the futurist view as we now have it originated in 1585 <coughs> with a Spanish Jesuit priest named Francisco Ribera and his purpose in formulating this view of Revelation was to counteract the Reformers' historist position. You see, Luther and others were publishing works based on the historist view of Revelation. And, of course, naming the popes as the Antichrist. Uh, the Catholic Church responded, the Jesuits in particular, with commentaries of their own supporting different approaches to the book of Revelation, including the futurist approach. And so it was Francisco Ribera, as all pretty much are aware, who are in touch with the history. I've read it in several uh, historical books, church history. Francisco Ribera originated this approach. And he did so, apparently, for the, simply for the reason of refuting the claim of the Reformers, that the Pope was Antichrist. Now, if the view has merits, if the futurist view in all other respects is a good view, and seems like the best view then I would not worry too much about its origins. It is, of course, possible that a uh, Spanish Jesuit discovered the true interpretation first before anyone else did. After all, anyone might discover it if they study it well enough and have the right presuppositions. But it's just, along with the other weaknesses of the view, 
it's uh, it's not to its advantage that it was written and uh, originated with uh, a polemical purpose. That is, with the purpose of arguing against the prevailing view in order to vindicate uh, the papacy. Uh, <clears throat> so, this to me is another disadvantage of the view. Now we come to the third view to consider, and that is the preterist view. This is a view that uh, I have come to have more and more respect for the more I study the book of Revelation and the more I study the Bible. Uh, in most respects, I probably would have to be called a preterist, although I don't follow, I don't follow preterism in, it, in the forms that I've found it uh, in books completely. There are, there are some preterist assumptions that I'm, I have trouble with. But uh, the basic idea of preterism is that it's the opposite of futurism. Futurist takes it all as future. Preterism takes it all as past. And the idea is that the book of Revelation predicted things that were in fact future from John's point of view, but are past from the 20th century point of view. Things that already have happened. One school of, of preterist believes that the entire book concerns itself only with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Another school of preterism holds that the first half of the book is about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and the second half of the book is about the fall of Rome. J. Adams is the main writer that I'm aware of who, who holds that particular preterist position. Both of these camps, of course, have something in common, and that is that they both say the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled. The arguments for both of these are fairly impressive, at least by my way of reckoning. When I read Jay Adams' book, I thought it was pretty impressive. He didn't fully convince me. Uh, since that time, I've read a couple of books that hold that the whole book of Revelation is about 70 AD, and they are also impressive, though I'm not fully convinced of their arguments either. So I, I'm not, as some kind of a mainline preter is coming to you, uh, with the view, but I do believe that once one is acquainted with the advantages of this view, it does tend to uh, it does tend to have some positive points in its in its uh, favor. Uh, among the advantages of the preterist view are the following: one, it makes perfectly good sense of the passages we mentioned earlier about these are things which must shortly come to pass, the time is at hand, and so forth. In fact, in addition to those, there are some other verses that are worth mentioning. In chapter 1, verse 19, chapter 1 and verse 19, the verse that I said the futurists view as the outline of the book, write the things that you have seen, the things which are, and the things that sh will take place after this. In the Greek, that last clause is the things that are about to take place after this. It's, it's not simply the things that will take place, but in the Greek, it's the things that are about to take place after this. So again, it suggests that the future part of the book of Revelation is talking about things not too far distant in the future. They're about to take place at, from the writer's standpoint. And over in chapter 22, <clears throat> particularly uh, impressive to my mind is, is the use of this verse which strikes me as having no explanation from a futurist point of view. Revelation 22.10 The angel said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now the, the statement, the time is at hand, uh, we found that way back in chapter 1, verse 3. That's not a new bit of information, but the instructions not to seal the book are very important. Because Daniel, in chapter 12 of that book, Daniel 12, was, set, was told that he should seal the book and that it was for the time of the end, for a later time, that it would have application. In other words, because Daniel's book was not going to have immediate fulfillment, he was told it was to be sealed. This book, however, is he's told don't seal this book because the time is at hand. In other words, it's strongly suggesting, it's very difficult to get around the suggestion, that he's saying it's going to have immediate fulfillment. Unlike Daniel's prophecies that awaited long-term fulfillment, the book of Revelation is going to have immediate fulfillment. Therefore, it should not be sealed, whereas Daniel's was sealed for a later time. Um, so the beginning, that is the opening statements in Revelation 1, and the closing statements in chapter 22 certainly emphasize the fact that the prophecies uh, look for a very near fulfillment. 
And the preterist view is the only view that really takes a serious um, approach to these verses. I mean, just takes it quite at face value. It doesn't have to explain them away. Another advantage of the futurist view is that if the things prophesied actually did have a, a near fulfillment, it makes the book relevant to the readers to whom it was sent. And we should hope for an interpretation of the book that would make it relevant to its original readers. He did not address the book of Revelation to the church of the 20th century, to whom these things would be fulfilled. It, he addresses it to first century congregations. And the things in the book are relevant to them, we should hope. And the preterist view is the only view that really makes the book relevant to its original readers. All other views would put it more, have much more distant fulfillment than, than would make it relevant to them. Uh, a third advantage of the preterist view is that the preterist view in, in applying much of these prophecies to 70 AD makes it agreeable with the Olivet Discourse. Now the Olivet Discourse of Christ found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke does predict the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD and many of the same features of the Olivet Discourse recur in the book of Revelation and nobody has missed that fact. No, no one who has studied the book of Revelation fails to mention that the book of Revelation is simply a longer version of the Olivet Discourse, a very much longer expanded version. In fact, many scholars are, feel comfortable calling the Olivet Discourse the Little Apocalypse because the book of Revelation is called the Apocalypse. And it's, it's a very common thing for commentators on Matthew or Mark or Luke when talking about the Olivet Discourse to call that the Little Apocalypse because the Olivet Discourse seems to be just a condensation of the same predictions in a, in, a, in a single chapter. Now, that being the case, if we can show that the Olivet Discourse had its fulfillment in 70 AD, and that is especially possible to do when you look at the Luke version, in Luke 21, where Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem, the disciples said, when shall these things be? And he goes on to explain in, in the discourse that follows when those things would be, and closes by saying, Verily I say to you, these, this generation will not pass before all these things are fulfilled. Then we have strong evidence that the Olivet Discourse talked about things that were shortly to come to pass, and particularly related to the destruction of the temple, which is the question the disciples asked at the beginning of the discourse, when shall this be? In other words, the Olivet Discourse would be about 70 AD. And since there is a close resemblance between Revelation and the Olivet Discourse, including a recurrence of most of the symbolic stuff, and even not symbolic, even literal stuff from the Olive Discourse recurs in the book of Revelation, it would appear that the subject matter is the same of the book of Revelation and the Olive Discourse. Furthermore, uh, as I've stated earlier in this school year a number of times, I think Christians generally have failed to appreciate the significance of 70 AD as a, as a historical turning point. Christians have not failed to recognize the cross and the resurrection of Christ as a historical turning point, and certainly that is perhaps the most important historical turning point that we would have to acknowledge. But 70 AD was sort of a another historical turning point uh, in the transition from the Old Covenant to the New. The destruction of the temple and the permanent end to sacrificial system was a very important thing, spoken of in all the prophets, and spoken of by Christ and by John the Baptist, and we should not be surprised if it was also spoken about in the book of Revelation. It has a very central um, role to play in biblical prophecy and therefore if the preterist is correct that the much of Revelation is about 70 AD then it would be of a piece with the rest of biblical prophecy and particularly with the Olivet Discourse uh, which it resembles very closely. A fourth advantage of this view is that it has impressive parallels with what Josephus writes, who was a witness of the fall of Jerusalem, but who was not personally acquainted with the book of Revelation, nor probably with the Olivet Discourse. Josephus was not a Christian. He lived in the first century, before, um, certainly before the Christian books were widely circulated, no doubt. And even if they were widely circulated in his lifetime, he probably didn't ever read them, since he was not a Christian himself. But Josephus was a historian who was an eyewitness of the fall of Jerusalem. And as we read through the book of Revelation, I will point out to you points where the book of Revelation seems to have very remarkable correspondence 
to things that happened in 70 AD as recorded by Josephus. And therefore, we have what looks like a near historic fulfillment, that is near in terms of time, historic fulfillment of the prophecies shortly after they were written. Um, a fifth advantage is that the preterist view renders intelligible certain verses that are unintelligible otherwise. A couple of these are Revelation 13, 18, where the number of the beast is mentioned is 666. Those who hold the preterist view generally assume that the number of the beast, uh, which is said to be the number of his name, it says, here is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. It has been demonstrated that the name of Caesar Nero, when rendered in Hebrew letters, Kaiser Neron, the numeric equivalent of each of the letters being added together comes out to 666. This has been observed by commentators from earliest times, I mean from early Christian history up until the present. And therefore, if the book of Revelation was written just prior to the fall of Jerusalem, that was also during the reign of Nero. And uh, if the beast be identified with the Roman Empire or with Nero, then the 666 is very easy to understand. Uh, if it is not a reference to Nero, and if the preterist view is not correct, then, of course, we fall into the, uh, the, you know, the, the trap of trying to identify every political leader on the, on the contemporary horizon as a possible 666 figure. And in my own short lifetime, I have seen Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, uh, Henry Kissinger, Saddam Hussein, um, Gorbachev and others, uh, where Christians have taken these individuals and tried to show that their name, if rendered in Greek or in Hebrew letters, uh, would come out to 666. See, what you have to understand is that both the Greek and the Hebrew language do not have a numeric system that's separate from their alphabet. They just use the letters of their alphabet for numbers. And so each letter has a numeric value. And so if you combine all the letters of a person's name in Hebrew or Greek, it would have a, a number value. And uh, so in modern times, a great number of people have been pointed to as, you know, by some way of twisting, um, their name could be seen to be 666, most uh, notably Ronald Reagan. What's his middle name? Anyone remember what Reagan's middle name was? Well, the important point is that his first middle name and his last name all have six letters. Ronald something Reagan. I forget what his middle name is, but his middle name has six letters also. And this was given by some interpreters as one of the best evidences that he must be the Antichrist because his name is 666. Well, um, the problem here, of course, is that if Nero is not the name in, implied in chapter 13, verse 18, then, then it's anybody's guess. Whereas the, the passage itself suggests that he who has wisdom in John's own day would be able to calculate the number of the beast and recognize the number of the name of the beast. Uh, in John's own day, he calls upon people to recognize what it is. Yes, Caleb? Um, if that's, I mean, in the Hebrew, wasn't this written in Greek to Greek-speaking people? Mm -hmm. I guess before I get to that one. We right, we'll get to that. If you ask why we would take it in the Hebrew rather than the Greek, the reason is because Nero himself would not be able to read Hebrew, though he could read both Latin and Greek. And if the idea is that if the, if the material fell into his hands, the reason it's written in code, for example, is that the enemy wouldn't recognize its meaning, but the Christians would. Uh, there's quite a bit of Hebrew in the book of Revelation. For instance, the word Armageddon uh, is, uh, is a Hebrew word, which means the mountain of Megiddo. And uh, also the name of the angel of the bottomless pit is given both in Greek and in Hebrew, Abaddon and uh, Apollyon are the Hebrew and the Greek names for this same person. So even though the book is written in Greek, there is an assumption of sort of a Hebrew character to the readership. The readership are intended to know something of Hebrew. And uh, so they would be at an advantage over the pagans in being able to identify the, the beast if his name was to be calculated when rendered in Hebrew. Uh, then the average pagan wouldn't be able to know what his name would be or what the number would be, but the Christian who is acquainted with Hebrew to some degree, would. Uh, we'll have more to say about that later when we get to this chapter. Another verse that makes sense in the preterist view that doesn't make good sense any other way is in chapter 17, verse 10. 
which says, there are also seven kings, which most interpreters understand to mean seven emperors. Five have fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Now, of the Roman emperors, the first Roman emperor was Julius Caesar. The sixth was Caesar Nero. From John's own standpoint, writing to the readers of his own day, he says, five of these kings have fallen. One now is, the sixth one is, and there's another one coming who will just continue a short time. When Nero committed suicide, Nero, the sixth ruler, the sixth emperor, I should say, the next emperor was Galba. He lasted only a few months before he was assassinated. And uh, so the most natural interpretation of verse 10 of chapter 17 would make the ruler uh, that was contemporary with the writing of the book be Nero. Now we've got, we need to consider later on, uh, you know, factors that would lean toward an early date or a late date of Revelation that comes up later on in our, in our notes here, but we'll have to move along first. Is there a hand up? No. Okay. Now, in all fairness, we have to point out that there may be some disadvantages to this view, like other views. It's obvious that I, that I see some strong points to preterism. But I also see a few, a few problems. I don't consider them insurmountable. One of the disadvantages is that it requires a date of writing prior to A.D. 70. Obviously. If it is predicting the fall of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 A.D., then it must have been written before that time. Now, the problem is that not all scholars agree that it was written before that time, and we're going to have a discussion of that later on. Yeah, it comes later on in our notes, um, on page uh, 6, probably. Yeah, the date and historical setting of the book. In my opinion is that a very strong case can be made for a date of writing prior to 70 A.D., but one of the problems is not all scholars agree with that, and there are some who would make a case for a later date of writing. And if, the, if their arguments are correct, which is a possibility, then that would exclude the preterist view. We'll just have to consider the date as a separate issue later on. But, of course, the preterism has this one vulnerability, that it stands or falls on the question of the early date of writing. There is no other view of Revelation that, that depends on a particular date of writing. That is, whether you chose the early or the late date of writing, futurism could be true, historism could be true, or these other views that we're going to study could be true, regardless of when it was written. Only preterism is vulnerable on this point, because it insists and it rests entirely on the conviction that the book must have been written before 70 AD. And if that could be disproven, which it has not yet been disproven, it's still a matter of great debate, then, of course, the disproving of the early date would be a disproving of preterism itself. And that is one of the disadvantages of the view. However, I hope to show that an early date is the most reasonable date from internal and external evidence uh, later to be considered. Now, a second disadvantage of preterism is that it, too, like futurism, is said to have begun in the Jesuit camp as a response to the Reformers. Uh, the book I'm reading, uh, the book I mentioned that was written by a historist, he doesn't like futurism or preterism because he says both of them were started by Jesuits. It is unquestionable that futurism was started by Francisco Ribera, who is a Jesuit priest, uh, a Jesuit, uh, Spanish Jesuit priest. Uh, it apparently is true also that Luis de Alcazar, who lived from 1554 to 1613, popularized preterism. Now I say popularized, although this book I'm reading says he made it up. The reason I don't accept that he made it up is because there was a commentary on Revelation written in the 6th century after Christ, much earlier than Alcazar's time. And it's quoted in uh, some contemporary works. And on, on Revelation 6.12, which is the opening of the 6th seal, the commentary written by a man named Arephus, written in the 6th century A.D., said, Some refer this to the siege of Jerusalem by Vespasian. On Revelation 7.1, Arephus writes, here then we manifestly sh uh, were manifestly shown to the evangelist what things were to befall the Jews in their war against the Romans in the way of avenging the sufferings inflicted upon Christ. At chapter 7, verse 4, Arethus writes, When the evangelist received these oracles, the destruction in which the Jews were involved was not yet inflicted by the Romans. Now all these statements coming from a 6th century commentator on Revelation sound, you know, identical to the modern preterist view. Uh, 
holding that the sixth seal is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and that the fate of the Jews at the hands of the Romans is what is under consideration in those chapters. Now, I don't know that Arephas would have considered the whole book of Revelation about, about that subject, but uh, the only modern view that would interpret those passages that way is the preterist view. So whether it be the correct view or not, it seems to have a history that goes back further before the Reformation, even, even you know, considerably earlier than that, almost a thousand years before the Reformation, and therefore Louis de Alcazar, who, who is credited with having come up with the preterist view, apparently was not the first to know of it. Although he did apparently popularize it, or attempt to popularize it, as a response to the historist view of the, of the Reformers, uh, the way I understand it, the historist view was such an embarrassment to the Catholic Church that two Jesuits, uh, Francisco Rivera and Luis de Alcazar, attempted to read re two different ways, one coming up with a futurist explanation and the other a preterist explanation. But as I pointed out from this earlier commentary, it does not seem that Alcazar was the originator of preterism. There must have been some belief in that back in the 6th century or before. Uh, so... We can't be sure where the origins of the Preterist view began. I don't know how early it was held, but we can demonstrate that at least some of the Preterist assumptions were in circulation as far back as the 6th century, and for all we know, maybe much earlier. Okay. <clears throat> we come now to the fourth position worthy of consideration, and that is the, what calls itself the progressive parallelist interpretation. This, I think, was first espoused by William Hendrickson in his commentary on Revelation called More Than Conquerors, which I read back in the early 70s and was very impressed by. In fact, until I became acquainted with preterism, I was a fairly convinced progressive parallelist. Uh, Hendrickson's commentary is very uh, impressive, and he seeks to show that the book of Revelation divides into seven parallel segments. And each of these segments deals with the entire church age, from the beginning of, from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. Not necessarily in the sense that the historist view teaches, that is, not necessarily that they give a running history of the whole church age, but that each of these segments deals with something relevant to the church age, some principle that may pertain to the whole period, for example. And those seven sections are said to be chapters 1 through 3, being the first section, Chapters 4 through 7 uh, would be the second. Chapters 8 through 11, the third. 12 through 14, the fourth segment. 15 and 16 would be the uh, fifth segment. Chapters 17 through 19, the sixth. And 20 through 22 would be the seventh segment of the book. And um, to the credit of this view, there are apparent references to the second coming of Christ, one reference in each of these segments as if to say each segment deals with the same period of time and ends with the second coming of Christ. The references are there in your notes. Uh, there appears to be a reference to the second coming of Christ, one such reference in each of these seven segments. So the idea would be that we can't take a chronological approach to the book of Revelation because some parts begin to tell the story all over again. You have chapters 1 through 3, but then the whole period begins again in chapters 4 through 7, then it starts over again in chapter 8, and then again in chapter 12. And then again in chapter 15, and again in chapter 20, or, or actually uh, chapter 17, and then 20. Now, uh, there are some advantages to this view, a number of them. One is that if this view were correct, then it resembles in some respects the way that Daniel is written. Now, everyone has always acknowledged the resemblance of Daniel in the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation have a lot in common with each other. And Daniel has instances where one chapter will tell of a period of history, and another chapter will tell the same period of history using different symbols. For example, Daniel chapter 2. We have the, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, and the, the image made of four metals, and, and the establishment of the kingdom of God, and so forth. And these four metals represent four successive world empires. The same four empires are depicted in chapter 7, under the figure of four beasts coming out of the sea. Now, chapters 2 and 7 of Daniel both predict the same period of time, even the same four empires in the same order, but they use different symbols. And according to the progressive parallelist view, uh, so does the book of Revelation, only it does so more so. 
it has seven segments that all talk about the same period of time in different symbols. So that the seven seals of the, of the scroll correspond to the seven trumpets, which also correspond to the seven bowls, and so forth. And that these uh, can be shown to be parallel to each other. Now, uh, also in favor of this view, there are a number of features in the book of Revelation where parallelism appears to be uh, present. Um, there are repeated mention of certain phenomena that are found, for example, in chapter 4, verse 5, an earthquake, that says there were uh, lightnings, thunderings, and voices, mentioned in chapter 4, verse 5, lightnings, thunderings, and voices. When you turn to chapter 8, verse 5, it says at the end of that verse, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the same three things are mentioned, only now an earthquake is added to them. And then when you turn to chapter 11, verse 19, we'll see the same four things. Uh, there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Hail is added to it now. And then, <clears throat> finally, in chapter 16 and verse 18, it says, And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake that had not occurred since men were on the earth. And then it says in verse 21, And great hail from heaven fell upon men, every hailstone about the weight of a talent, or a hundred pounds. So we have the same phenomena mentioned again and again and again. Uh, the progressive parallelists would say that has to do with the same things in each case, just uh, these, they're in parallel sections. There's also a certain battle that is mentioned repeatedly in different sections. In chapter 16, verse 14, it says, For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So there's the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Then over in chapter 19, we see again this great battle. Chapter 19, verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the, on the horse and against his army. There's the battle again. In chapter 20, which according to this view would begin a second, uh, the seventh segment, a different segment than chapter 19. It says in verse 9, chapter 20, verse 9, they went up the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. Well, actually, we need to read uh, the previous verses too. Verse 8, anyway. Uh, the dragon will go out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea, and they went up the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Uh, so here we have three different times this battle is mentioned. In chapter 16, in chapter 19, and chapter 20, which happen to be three different segments of the book by this way of reckoning. So we argue this is the same battle in each case. It's just that these segments parallel each other and talk of it in three different contexts. Then there's an interesting correlation between the seven trumpets, which are found in the second segment, I'm sorry, in the third segment, and the seven bowls of wrath, which are found in, I believe it's the fifth segment. And if you'll notice, I, I've given the references in the notes. We won't take the time to look at all these simply because that would be very time-consuming. But the first trumpet and the first bowl of wrath both affect the earth. The second of each, that is of the trumpets and the bowls, affect the, the sea. The third of each affect the rivers. The fourth of each affect the sun, the moon, and the stars, or the heavenly bodies. The fifth of each affect men. The sixth of each affect the Euphrates River, and the seventh of each seem to spell the end, the end of whatever the series is. So there's an interesting correspondence between the two. It is argued by uh, Hendrickson that this points out that there's a parallelism here, that the trumpets are simply parallel to and the same thing as the bowls. Okay? Now, there are some disadvantages to this view. There are a number of advantages, it seems to me, and probably more than I've listed here. Uh, I used to be fairly convinced of this view before I became more acquainted with the advantages of the preterist view. By the way, I have changed my view many times in the book of Revelation, which should warn you not to just follow my interpretation, since I may change again. I would say that my, ch my repeated changes, however, have not reflected uh, vacillation. 
for instance, I haven't gone from one view to another, then back to that view, and then back, you know, back and forth between the same views. But rather, as I've been acquainted with the merits of different views and weighed them against the merits of other views, I have tended to be more convinced as time goes on that certain views are trustworthy. That's why I said earlier, until I read a commentary from a historist view, I can't really tell you whether that's the, uh, uh, the best view or not. But I once thought that the arguments for the progressive parallelist view were the best. Uh, but I was not yet acquainted with the arguments for preterism, and when I weighed the arguments for preterism against it, it seemed to me more convincing. Um, and I seriously doubt that historism would convince me more, but I, I should give it a fair trial before I would pronounce upon it. Um, the disadvantages of this view, as it seems to me, is that those seven references to the second coming of Christ, one for each of the seven segments, when you look at them in their context, are probably not all references to the second coming of Christ at all. They contain a lot of apocalyptic language, and in my opinion, some of them certainly are not talking about the second coming of Christ. Taken very literally, all of those references that they give as, as references to the second coming of Christ do look like the end of the world. But um, it's questionable whether that's, whether that's the correct way to understand them, and I think not in many of these cases. Um, just when we look at them individually, you'll see why. Another uh, disadvantage is that the material that seems to be parallel, like the seven trumpets and the seven bowls, is only parallel in terms of style. It is not necessarily predicting the same events. For instance, the, the trumpets affect one-third of the earth and of the sea and of the rivers and of the stars and so forth, whereas the bowls affect all, the entirety of it. And therefore, there's a deliberate uh, greater intensity of the latter over the former. Furthermore, when the bowls of wrath are introduced in chapter 15, verse 1, before they begin to be poured out, it specifically says in chapter 15, verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. In saying these are the last plagues, it suggests that some of the earlier things mentioned were previous, and that this segment that we're about to read, chapters 15 and 16, really uh, follows chronologically, because it is the last, some of the earlier ones. Now, I am not opposed, for the most part, of seeing Revelation divided into seven segments. But I would warn against, in fact, that's how I've outlined the book later on in your notes, I've outlined it in seven parts, because it's, it seems to obviously divide into seven parts. The question is whether these segments should be seen as all parallel to each other. I think not, largely due to, because chapter 15, one mentions that that segment, which is chapters 15 and 16, gives us the last plagues, it certainly suggests that it is later in history than some of the earlier things that were in other segments. And so, while there is, there is some parallelism that I think we have to acknowledge, it's uh, a little too simplistic to say each of these seven parallels all the others. And I'll, again, as we go through, uh, you'll see why I think it is. The fifth view that we need to consider is the idealist view. <coughs> now, the idealist view basically teaches that the book of Revelation isn't predicting any particular historic time period or any historical event, but it's just symbolically depicting for us certain great abiding principles, like the sovereignty of God and the victory of Christ over Satan and the vindication of the martyrs who have died for Christ and how they are vindicated in heaven and in history. And spiritual warfare. These are some of the great principles that are thought to be depicted in the book of Revelation by the idealists. And they would say, they would guard against trying to apply any of the symbols toward any particular historical fulfillment of anything. But rather say, these things are just you know, uh, overarching principles of, of Christian life and of God's dealings in the earth uh, and not to, not to be attached to particular events. Um, now, the advantage of this view is that it avoids the difficulty of harmonizing specific passages in Revelation with specific events uh, or fulfillments, which, and this difficulty has been a plague to the historists and to the preterists and to the futurists. That is, the historist tries to figure that these things refer to certain historical events throughout the whole church history. The futurist tries to apply them to things that are now happening and in the future. And the preterist tries to apply them all to events that happened in the past. 
But the historists, futurists, and preterists all have this in common. They're, they all try to find historical fulfillments, his, historical events that correspond to the things that are prophesied. The idealist view avoids that problem. It says, hey, it doesn't refer to any particular events. It's just these ideas that are being graphically played out uh, for us so that we can appreciate more fully and be more inspired by this uh, graphic, uh, dramatic portrayal of the sovereignty of God and of his vindication over the mar uh, of the martyrs and of his victory over Satan and so forth. Um, the disadvantage of this position is that the book itself claims to be a proxy of specific events. It opens up in verse 1 saying that it is predicting events that must shortly come to pass. And uh, therefore it does seem to me that the idealist doesn't take that seriously enough, that the prophecy is about events that would recognizably occur and have an actual fulfillment in history. Um, now, the great themes of the sovereignty of God and spiritual warfare and Christ's victory over Satan and the vindication of martyrs certainly are found in the book, but that doesn't mean that we should ignore the, the specific fulfillments in history of the things predicted, because there are such fulfillments implied uh, in the book. So I don't hold the idealist view, though we should be aware of it. Some uh, I've read a few commentaries that seem to hate, hold that view. So these are the views. The historist view, the futurist view, the preterist view, the progressive parallelist view, and the idealist view. I have uh, already indicated my preference of, of those Five, if I had to choose one, I'd definitely lean most toward the preterist view, but I'd like to even suggest a different approach than that. And so we have the uh, suggested approach there, combining the strongest points of the above views of all of them, and guided by the sound exegetical use of relevant cross-references throughout the rest of Scripture, coupled with historical knowledge where it's available, like from Josephus or elsewhere. Let's decide on the interpretation of each passage on its own merits. In other words, without coming to the book with a with a preset commitment to one of these schools of interpretation. Let's just look at the passages one by one and compare scripture with scripture and where, where it's possible compare historical fulfillments with uh, things that have happened. And on, on the basis of these considerations, let's determine about each passage. Is this something that's already been fulfilled? Is this something that pertains to the whole church age? Is this something that's yet future? And while that may seem to be a non-committal attitude and a cowardly way and say, well, you know, I don't want to rile, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to commit myself to these views, so we just say maybe all of them are correct in some ways. Um, no, I don't think they're all correct. But I do think that the variety of interpretations that have been held by Christian scholars suggest that one view probably can't explain all the data. And while one view may be much closer to being correct more often than another view, I do believe that there's indications of uh, something uh, more extensive than any one of the views suggests. My particular view at, at this point, at the beginning of this series, is that the preterist view answers most of the questions for me. But I believe that the preterist view uh, does not, that the book uh, encompasses more than the fall of Jerusalem. I believe that the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD is predicted in the book of Revelation, and I believe it's a very prominent feature, but I believe there's some segments of the book that, that, that carry us beyond 70 AD, all the way to the second coming of Christ. And I will tell you where those segments are as we go through, and I'll tell you why. I'm not going to take any artificial approach. I've been teaching the book of Revelation too long and read too many conflicting views to be too glib or to be, uh, or to be arbitrary. Uh, I've, I've been very cautious in my own approach for the past few years because the more I've become aware of other views, the more I've realized how foolish it is to be dogmatic on the book of Revelation. And I want to make it clear that it is not my desire at all to make you believers in my particular approach. That is why I've told you all the approaches that I'm aware of, told you what I consider to be the merits and the demerits of each view, uh, if there are other merits or other demerits to these views, I'm not aware of them. And I've tried to give you as much as possible the ability to choose for yourself what view to take. And some of you, I'm sure, came in here, maybe all of you came in here as futurists. Maybe some of you will leave as futurists, and that's fine with me. Some of you, no doubt, will leave as preterists or, or have some other view, but that too is fine with me. As a Bible teacher, I'm just compelled to teach the material as best I can understand it.
And uh, it's certainly up to you as a listener and as a Bible student to allow the Holy Spirit to confirm to your own heart uh, the merits of the particular things I say or, or the demerits of them, as the case may be. So uh, just going into it, I need to let you know that I'll, I'll probably lean very strongly in the, in the direction of preterism in much of my interpretation. Uh, but there are some points where I'll depart from it. And they are at logical intervals. There, are, I mean, there are reasons for this. It's not just because I can't fit them in to the preterist view, but because because the way I see the whole passage comparing scripture to scripture often leads me to the view that we're looking at something that goes beyond that. What I have attempted to do in the past, and I will still attempt to do as much as as I can objectively, is as we go through the Book of Revelation, passage by passage, to tell you what a futurist would say about this, what a preterist would say about it. As far as I know, what a historist would say about it, and what an idealist would say about it, or whatever. I, I, now, I used to be able to do this much more objective, uh, objectively because I was much less committed to one view, and I was you know, quite unsure what I thought was true myself. And there were years when I taught the book of Revelation where I just had to say, well, here's the five choices on this passage. Make up your own mind. Um, uh, in my own, in the development of my own thinking and my own research, I've definitely come to lean much more toward one view than the others, but I still hope uh, to, I'll do my best to be objective, to give you the options to, and you can, of course, make your own decisions on each passage or even on the overall picture. Now, <clears throat> as I said, one of the great drawbacks of the Preter's view, a view which I, which I tend to lean toward, is that it is vulnerable to the proof of a later date. That is, if the date of the writing of Revelation is after 70 AD, then the preterist view cannot be correct. And therefore, uh, the great weakness is that you must be convinced of a pre-70 AD date of writing in order for preterism to make sense. And uh, if you do hold to a pre-70 AD date of writing, then you will certainly be at odds with a number of great scholars on the book of Revelation, but you'll also be in the company of a number of great scholars who've held this view. We can't go into that next. That's our next thing to consider. Uh, so we'll save that for the next time. When we come back to our introduction of Re Revelation, we'll be able to finish this handout. We'll, we'll uh, spend our almost entire time talking about the date and the historical setting, followed by uh, sort of a survey of the book, an outline of how the whole book is laid out, and then, of course, we'll be ready to get into the text itself. All right, and so we'll close with that. And uh, hopefully Caleb will wake up and hit the button on the machine. It's over. It's all over, Caleb. It's all over.